morning, Jeff Miller, Coldwell Banker Commercial, also a board member uh, for the Salem Chamber. So with that, we're going to turn it over. Nicole, you can do a quick introduction if you want, but I think people know you've been here a few times now. And I know you got a <laughs> You may have seen my face in the last couple of weeks on a magazine. <laughs> Just to say there is a podium. Some people don't like coming up here, so hopefully we can get that on camera as we're going. Dan, is that working for you right there? Perfect. Please, Nicole. Thank you. Good morning, Nicole Palmatier Hazel Baker. I am the owner and principal at Bravio Communications, lobbying firm based here in Salem. We represent the state and federal levels. I'm happy to be here on behalf of the chamber. So uh, this has been an exciting week, and it's only Thursday. Wow, lots going on. Uh, we had House Bill 2002, Reproductive Rights and Gender Affirming Care, up on the Senate floor. I'm not Senate floor. Um, Senate Bill 2002. Um, we had gender affirming care and reproductive rights on the House floor this week for nine hours. It did pass. Uh, we had House Bill three hours, which is a bill around firearms. Uh, we had a Secretary of State resign this week. We now have a floor protest going on in the Senate and a lawsuit that has been filed around the some of the procedural things around the bills. So we are clearly moving into the next phase of the legislative session where things start to slow way down as the controversial bills are moving through and the, the subject matter becomes, I would say, certainly one of more concern dependent upon which party you're in. Um, we are moving towards Friday, which is the deadline for policy bills to be posted for a work session. About There's been about 3,000 bills filed. Out of those, about 1,400 of them made it through the first deadline. We'll lose another chunk of those after tomorrow and moving on towards May 19th when the policy bills have to move out of committee. Um, this floor slowdown that's happening in the Senate could go on a pro at least a week, so that just impacts deadline, how things are happening. A couple of things I wanted to chat about. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about the bridge. Tolling has been delayed now until 2026. Uh, there has been a tremendous amount of public comment to the Department of Transportation and to legislators about that particular topic. It's extremely unpopular, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, the group of Democrats filed a bill that would have delayed it, and based on that, they went ahead, the governor went ahead and delayed until 2026. That does, however, throw a kink in the I-5 bridge replacement because the tolling is supposed to be a piece of the funding for that replacement, as well as bonding capacity. But what you're seeing right now is the governor and the legislature have two different sets of priorities, and those are starting to bump heads. For example, the legislature would like to use a significant amount of the bonding capacity of the state to pay for Oregon's portion of the bridge that we would like to ante up as a state, apparently. On the other hand, the governor would like a significant portion of that bonding capacity to go to housing and homelessness. So now we're at a standoff. And what you're seeing is a lot of other bills that are kind of being held up or moved around or things based on some of these head-to-head -head fights that are about to happen. The legislature can ultimately decide what happens, but the governor does carry line item veto in all of the budgets. And that's a big thing for state agencies. So we're gonna watch that start playing out here over the next few weeks. Uh, I've been having a lot of great conversations with the Salem delegation. We have some great legislators that are really interested in hearing the voice of Salem business, the voice of the Salem chamber. They're delighted that we are here at the table in the Capitol and having those conversations. And a couple of things we've been talking about that we've been talking about within this group are the concept of business incentives for Salem. Not only how do we attract new business, but how do we keep business owners here in Salem? It has not been easy over the last couple of years. I was just reading something the other day talking about how, you know, the um, prevalence of state-owned buildings, state agencies here, state hospitals, state prison, it takes, it takes a toll on business. You know, we are addressing a different population than perhaps other cities are. We are also now dealing with a lot of empty state buildings. We're dealing with the new remote workforce that's happening. What <clears throat> can we do to help Salem business? Legislators are very interested in this, having this conversation possibly in 2024, a concept in 2024. What might that ask be? Along with that is paid family medical leave. Um, there's been a lot of work during the session to align that with the Oregon Family Leave Act, which rolled out a bit ago, did not roll out very smoothly. Senate Bill 999 is the bill that's trying to put those two things together. However, as we've talked about before, there is the bill has passed that would offer a delay in rolling out paid family medical leave if the fund is determined insolvent. 
to be determined if it is or is not. You know, they don't really know that yet, but if it is, they could delay it. However, nobody expects paid family medical leave to roll out well. It just Those things just never do, and there'll be a lot of issues. But what we have been talking about to legislators is how do you help employers withstand that paid family medical leave. You know, again, speaking from my experience, I know if my husband's mechanic went out for 12 weeks, he is the mechanic. You can't temp agency that out. You can't just find somebody for 12 weeks to fill that position. And some legislators said, well, why don't you just, you know, find somebody? Well, it's not that simple. But Particularly in smaller businesses, you have the one person who knows how to do your bookkeeping, who knows how to do your accounting and HR. What do you do to help employers survive that 12 weeks? Um, again, I would say that our delegation is interested in having that conversation and what can they do to help. And that's their question back to us. And so, you know, Chalene and Tom, you know, let's think about how we can help answer that question. They're interested in 2024, the short session. We file bills for 2024, usually in September. So it comes really fast. So I, I look forward to that conversation with this group and with the board around that. Tom and Lena came with me to meet with Representative Anderson on his concept around a work group on a potential rail or something, trolley for downtown city of Salem. Um, whether he is successful in obtaining the funds to get to that work group, we don't know yet, but he is interested in having the chamber as a part of that. I think there are a lot of opinions, certainly differing from his around what he might be proposing versus what business might think would be a more amenable option, but I do believe it's important to be at the table, even if we don't necessarily agree with what the proposal out the door is. So more conversation with that, and I know the board is considering that as well. A couple other quick things, because I'm a lobbyist and I talk really quickly. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, DEQ rulemaking that's talking about commuter option. They want to take the current project that's working, in, that they're, they have implemented in Portland that's pushing employers to have at least 15% of their workforce in some sort of non-commuting type of situation. And they're trying to push that out. We've been continuing to do research on that. DEQ has been very quiet about it. They aren't talking too much about it. There are seven cities they want to roll this out to. Salem, of course, is one. Salem, Bend, Eugene, Medford, Roseburg. Um, not all cities that it makes sense and certainly not all cities where it makes sense to employers. I know the city of Salem has been participating in the work groups as well as Salem Transit. I did learn from talking to one of my fire chiefs in Eugene that cities kind of have a different perspective and certainly I defer to all of our fine experts here from the city, but as a rule, a city probably has hit that 15% mark simply due to remote work. So, you know, I was talking to my fire chief in, in Eugene and he said, you know, as a whole city, the city of Eugene has already made it. So, you know, it, it isn't perhaps as onerous as it might be to a private employer and what they're considering with it. So um, another one that had been brought up at the board meeting, there's a diesel emissions identification rulemaking project going on with DEQ. Public comment can be taken through May 22nd. This only applies to construction, but what they're asking is for a voluntary opt-in to identify every diesel piece of equipment that you have, that you're working in a construction site or within your construction company. Um, I think there are, I'm sure, I so I know, there are a lot of concerns with where that might be going. We will continue to keep an eye on that. I know we've communicated back to Rich Duncan about that, so who had brought that up, but um, yeah, you can ask me offline what I think about that. Uh, you might have heard a little bit about House Bill 3501, Right to Rest. So this bill has come up previously, so it caused a lot of a fuss because there was an informational hearing schedule, but the bill actually couldn't move forward. So uh, being the good citizen that I am, I read that a city council will be doing some alignment with the current laws that are in place around where individuals who are unhoused are able to stay and then when they may be asked to move. Right to rest is a concept that's been brought up a few times that would say that it would not allow that movement, if you will. That is has been put to rest for this session. It's not moving forward, but I would expect to see it again. And I would say, you know, different entities have different stakes in it. For example, from the fire service, you know, they have a grave concern. You can't have somebody camping out where we move the trucks out. That's not going to work. We don't have time to get them out of the way, as I'm sure Chief Nibelock could answer better than I could. So those are some of the things. Rulemaking, when the state always concerns me over during the last governor's administration, maybe because of COVID, maybe just because we saw a lot of bills passed that said, we'll just take it all to rulemaking. And rulemaking concerns me because it takes some of the oversight out of the, from the legislature and puts it into with the state agency only. 
And it's a little harder to impact that. It really requires keeping a very diligent eye on it and paying attention to it. So things like the commuter policy that they're looking at or diesel emissions, but it, it you have to kind of know how where to go and where to find it to um, pay attention to that and be able to impact it. So those are a few things I have today. I'm happy to answer quick questions, but thank you so much for letting me represent you and also for letting me speak first. Sure. So real quickly, I did not do a great job. Well, we are blessed here at the chamber to be able to have the ability to hire a lobbyist for the first time. And it's really important. I think from my perspective, I really have appreciated this relationship and having someone here that can report to us uh, on a regular basis. So thank you for that. Um, with that, any questions for Nicole before we release her to run? Thank you. Uh, Timeline, when is the first option for public comment? Sure. So uh, commuter or diesel emissions? So they've had two meetings so far, and we are like poking them every week, trying to figure out when the next one is. They're already behind their timetable, so we don't know. You know, they're, they're not doing a good job surprise, surprise, about posting, you know, their minutes or what happened in the meeting. So we'll continue to prod at them in the next opportunity for a public comment. We'll make sure that this group absolutely knows. What about the diesel side of it? Diesel side is open now for public comment through May 22nd. And if you want information on how to impact that, let me know. Or actually, I'll just send it to Lena and then um, she can get that out to people. But well, last time we hear you, you spoke about the surplus of funds the state has. For yes. And I think at that point, uh, you had mentioned that they're trying to figure out what to do with those funds, give them back to people. Has there been any more conversation in that direction now? Sure. So the kicker will kick this year. It's one of the biggest kicker we've ever had. Um, and that's going to come back to taxpayers. On May 17th, we'll have the next revenue forecast, and that will give the legislature the dollar amount that they're going to be allowed to spend. Um, and we'll then get an idea of what they're going to do with it. Uh, I read something the other day that said, as a rule, the economic revenue forecasts are about 23% accurate. Um, so they don't do a great job. They generally undershoot it. I was talking to the CPAs yesterday. I said, if my CPA was 23% accurate, I'd be looking for a new CPA. But uh, so we're about to find out. And everything really right now is sort of waiting right here for that May 17th date, because as you can imagine, there's a lot of people asking for money. Any other questions for Nicole before we release? Nicole, thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate being here. We will now transition over into city budgets and forecasts. But before we do, real quickly, Tom, um, I'd like to turn it over to you for just a moment. And then uh, from after Tom, I know some of the people don't want to come up here to the podium, and I think that's probably understandable and okay. Uh, so I will then sit down and we'll kick it off, Mayor, with however you want to start. Well, thank you, Jeff, and uh, good morning. And for uh, I want to be real open for all of these people. It really is a very early one. Uh, we wrapped up last night at about 9.30 uh, council chambers. Uh, two more work sessions have been established. There is the possibility uh, that everything could be wrapped up next Wednesday evening. Uh, and let's see by the mayor's educate. Uh, not a lot of optimism there. Uh, so uh, I think in a very smart move, the group had set up more. But as Josh will uh, share, it does really come into a, a pretty plain bucket that we got to be uh, moving forward with timelines for public testimony to like. I want to just contextually uh, help us understand today. This is really just the introduction to where we're at in this point in time as they're preparing their budget. But uh, we are working with Courtney Knox Bush and the city to also have our group involved in uh, another segment of how we look at this budget. And so you are gonna be invited uh, as well as a lot of our members within this organization to actually participate in a second piece of this after this meeting. So this is gonna set the table and then we're going to uh, be able to dive deeper as an organization and provide some feedback. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Hoy to start us off and kick us off. And then I believe there's a cadence that uh, you and, and City Manager Staley uh, will follow through here. So I uh, thank all these individuals for joining us this morning, as well as a volunteer, uh, Paul Deegan, 
Paul, thank you so much for being here as well. It was a, as a volunteer, you know, many of these people are as well. Uh, in their roles, uh, they just happen to be so elected. I uh, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we have a PowerPoint that we're going to be starting through here. I'm looking, where's Courtney? Oh, she's not in. They have it. Okay, great. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for that PowerPoint because my brain is not quite going yet. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of set the stage a little bit. This is this is what we're going to talk about. Um, how we got to where we're at. One of the things it was interesting in talk in hearing from uh, the lobbyist about the you know having the state buildings here and the impact on small business. Well, they also have a significant impact on uh, city government because those non-taxable entities have a huge impact. We do not receive a payment in lieu of taxes, unlike some of our friends in the room who do get a payment in lieu of taxes from the state government. Um, so we we provide services uh, to all of those uh, state facilities with, with no revenue to help with that. But I wanted to talk for a minute about, especially for those who may be new to Oregon or maybe don't remember a little bit of history. And I want to, I want to go back about 30 years to measure five, measure 47 and measure 50. Those are the property tax limitation measures that, that were passed um, over the last couple of decades. They are really uh, the drivers of why we are where we are. And it, this is not unique to Salem. This is, a, this is an issue that every local government is dealing with. Uh, every city in Oregon, uh, if you look around at our comparable cities, there are many cities who are in a significant budget crisis right now. Uh, they're looking at layoffs. Uh, because these property tax limitation measures have, you know, they come home to roost, so to speak. The idea was to limit government, and it's working. Uh, and that might, that I think was probably the goal of them, but then uh, I think that it was, there were some unintended consequences. Since I can't remember the it, 2009, I think it is, we have added equivalent to a, a city of Woodburn to our city in terms of population. We've added that many individuals to our population at, here in Salem, and we have not gotten a commensurate amount of revenue to provide services to that population. We are growing faster than our revenue is able to keep pace because of these property tax limitation measures that cap our, our, our uh, revenue at 3%. So, so we are just, I think it was just last year, we finally got back to staffing levels that we had in 2008, 2009. So for people who ask us, why, why aren't you cutting? Why aren't you? We have cut and cut and cut and we're just, We've just now built back to levels from 15 years ago. And, and again, that population has continued to grow. So that's kind of, I just kind of wanted to set the table a little bit with that. And uh, we can go on to the, uh, to the next slide. So um, let's see. We, if you all remember back to pre-COVID time, we implemented, the city council implemented an operations fee not unlike many of the jurisdictions around us, uh, Marion County imposed a fee to pay for deputies out in East Salem. I think Kaiser has an operations fee. Many local governments have put these band-aids on their revenue situation because of these property tax limitation measures. We have a we have a very few things that we can do to actually increase revenue. The operations fee was one of them. Also at that time, we had referred a an employee paid payroll tax to the voters. And that was literally just as COVID was starting. And, and I actually made the motion, the very difficult motion to withdraw that uh, measure from the ballot before it actually went to voters because of the uncertainty that we were facing with COVID. And I think in hindsight, I think that was really the right move uh, in terms of where, where the community was. It certainly wasn't the right move for the city's budget, but it was the right move for the community. And so we withdrew that, so you didn't actually get a chance to vote on it. But so our situation has just continued uh, since that time to, to uh, our crisis has deepened. And so now we are at a situation where we, we really have to look at additional revenue sources. We did have, um, you know, the, the downside to, to COVID was that, you know, it devastated so many things. 
the one upside was that we got some federal money that really got us through and allowed us to do some things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Uh, frankly, it's why we're able to start launching commercial air service because we're, there's some ARPA money from the county and, and other sources that were that allowed us to do that. We're able to the homeless response that we have going is all paid with one-time dollars, and we knew that going in uh, that these were one-time dollars. But those, all of those things were are we're able to do because of that, that those federal dollars that came in. But of course, those are running out, and so those programs. Uh, find a way to sustain them uh, those homelessness programs will ha will have to end and we've been lobbying and you know talking to the uh, our partners at the state and the federal government to try to help us uh, in, with varying degrees of success and um, we're hopeful that more money will come through we're we're uh, really hopeful that we'll have a fix to our system where even if it's just for Salem that we start to get a payment in low taxes to actually help our structural flaw with our budget uh, that would be ideal, ultimately, fix for the property tax system, which is really the best solution where so all local governments are able to, to be funded. So I think I'm going to stop there and turn it over to our city manager to really dive into the detail about the need, where we're at, where we're going, and that sort of thing. All right. Let's go to the next slide and see what it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to talk about this. Yep. There's no way in heck I can read that from the slide eight. Thank you. Um, so this was uh, this is what happens on there you go. six hours sleep. Okay. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of some of our peer cities, if you can't see that, it's at, across the top. It's Eugene, Gresham, Hillsborough, Bend, Springfield, Corvallis, comparable cities in in the state. Um, do you have a current a current or projected deficit across the board? Yes. Uh, what's the amount? And you can read those across anywhere from fifteen to twenty million in Eugene. 15.295 in Gresham. Uh, I don't know what that number is in Hillsborough. It's a little smudgy. Um, uh, Bend, it says 11. Springfield, not so bad, 566,000. And Corvallis, 7.1 million. Um, are you looking at additional revenues or service cutbacks uh, across the board? Yes. And what are the various things that you're looking at? And these, you can just see a bunch of different things there. Payroll tax, multiple option levies, um, local option levies, street light fees, dispatch fees, parks utility fees. So I, I, we wanted to put this up there to really, this is actually a slide from a recent um, work session that we did with city council to kind of paint the picture. Like this isn't a Salem only thing. This is across the board for all the reasons I just spoke about regarding our broken tax system. So now I'll turn it over to the city manager. <laughs> Next slide. So, Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Staley. I'm the city manager. Uh, I get to work with all of these great people. One of my jobs is to put together the budget proposal and to sign it and submit it to the city council and the budget committee for their consideration. Uh, we did that a few weeks ago. And as the mayor has indicated, we're in the midst of our budget process. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, given what we just saw and learned, our situation in Salem is no different than the situation from municipal governments across the state of Oregon. Uh, I was at the League of Oregon Cities meeting last week, and guess what the conversation was about? Uh, universally, it was about revenues, and it was about budget shortfalls, and it was about cutting staffing and doing the hard work of figuring out how to run a local government. Uh, Salem's decade of excellence. Uh, on November 8th of this past year, 2022, uh, the city of Salem voters passed by 64%, 64 point something percent, almost 65%, a $300 million public infrastructure bond. Uh, and that bond will allow us to build roads and sidewalks and trails and parks and recreation facilities, buy new fire equipment, build new fire stations, acquire library sites, support affordable housing, put in new uh, uh, information technology system to make, make our cybersecurity much better and to upgrade our city hall so that it meets 
current seismic requirements and standards. Uh, but what that $300 million bond issue does not do is pay for any of the humans to support those systems, the parks and recreation facilities, the fire stations, the libraries, et cetera. Uh, so that's the reality of where we are. And as the mayor has indicated over time, you know, going all the way back to 2008, uh, our staffing level is exactly the same. We have the same number of fire stations. We have the same number of police officers. We have the same personnel, not the same people. They've, you know, there's been some retirements and some changes, new city manager and things like that. But we have the same number of people uh, in the organization. So the next step in this process of moving forward is considering our revenue alternatives. And I know, you know, the first reaction in any government setting is to say, okay, what can you cut? And the reality is, I would say nothing. Uh, and we've had our consulting team take a pretty deep look at this. And frankly, when we start talking about cuts today, we are talking about cuts in services that people value in this community. Things like closing down Center 50 plus, closing our library, reducing our parks to 50% of what it currently is, uh, eliminating our neighborhoods program, eliminating our youth services program, uh, eliminating our any support or response to uh, homelessness. So th those are the level of services that would absolutely have to get cut. And then of course there would be and and frankly, the, the magnitude of the cuts that we're talking about extend well beyond the ability to, to keep our core services, our police and fire department, unimpacted, not impacted. Uh, they too would also be impacted. So we'd be talking about closing fire stations and reducing the number of police officers that we have. I don't want to do that. I don't think that that's what our community expects from us. Uh, and I don't think it would be fair to our community to do that. So I put forward a budget proposal that included an increase in our operations fee and also anticipates next year, a employee paid payroll tax. Uh, and that's where we are in the midst of this debate and conversation. So next slide. You know, there, there's lots of ways to look at and talk about our staffing requirements. This just puts it into, you know, stark terms going all the way back to 1990. And you had uh, a peak number of employees in 2008 and then, you know, sharp declines uh, in 14 and 15 and then a slow rise back up. Uh, as the mayor indicated, We've added 26,000 people to the community of Salem since 2008. That is approximately the size of the city of Woodburn. I know that the city of Woodburn has a police force, has a fire force, has parks and recreation, and all of the things that a city has. We haven't added that additional capacity to our system uh, since 2008. Uh, our employees per thousand, as you can see, have declined, you know, accordingly. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, we have looked at this deeply. This is not something that, you know, we're coming at casually, asking the community for more dollars. We've looked backwards and said, okay, how did we get here? Thank you, Mayor for that explanation, but we're also looking forward. And our we have a consultant, Moss Adams. They are an accounting and performance management consultancy. They came in and looked at our staffing levels compared to other communities up and down the West Coast. As you can see, the, uh, the functions and services that are in red are below the comparables. Uh, those that are in uh, are at or above the comparables. But even when you look deeply at the, the functions and services that are in green, 
that's because we do a lot of our IT work in-house and many organizations uh, contract that work out. So the cost center is in a different place other than in the employees. Next slide. So Salem's response, as I've said, uh, we're proposing both an operations fee and an employee paid payroll tax. Uh, next slide. Operations fee is a very blunt tool. Uh, it's very hard to shape it so that it's fair and equitable. Uh, and it's even harder because of the limitations associated with our software system right now. We're operating an antiquated system. We do have a contract in place to replace that system that would give us some more flexibility going forward. But the tool that we have today is an operations fee. Uh, based on residential, uh, multifamily residential and commercial. And that's what I am proposing in our budget is to increase that operations fee. I would suggest that over the course of the next year, we look at alternatives to that fee to make it more uh, less regressive uh, and more fairly distributed between single family residential, multifamily residential, and different classes of commercial. Uh, we've also put forward and are considering a employee paid payroll tax. Again, that does not affect the 2024 budget, the budget that we're currently under discussion. But guess what? You can't, although we do budget year to year, you can't plan year to year. Uh, that is that is not planning, that is reacting. So we do a financial forecast. That financial forecast projects out five years. And guess what? Uh, year 25, 26, 27, it gets bad. Uh, we simply cannot adopt our 2026 budget uh, with the revenue structure and the employee structure that we have today. Uh, again, going back to where we started, that would mean substantial cuts to all of the programs that you see represented in this room and all the programs that I've talked about uh, thus far today. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, operations fee. I am proposing in this year's budget that the operation fee be used both to cover some components of existing service and to add to uh, some of the service deficit or to <laughs> decrease some of the service deficit that has been existent for the last 15 years by addressing some of the non-law enforcement public safety responses, things like code enforcement, park rangers, our safety, our services and outreach, sustainable, Help me out, Courtney. The safety and outreach service team. Thank you. The SOS team, <laughs> which isn't even, yeah, SO, the SOS team, uh, uh, which is the, the crew that we have out on the street picking up shopping carts and trash and debris and visiting homeless encampments and helping connect people to services and helping people find different places to be where they're safer and less impactful. Uh, and then the employee paid payroll tax, we would, we were looking at a variety of different options there, ranging from 0.49 to 0.66%, you know, uh, of, of a percent. Uh, and that again, would cover a variety of existing and expanded public safety related services, including uh, opening up that new fire station uh, that was included in our bond uh, measure. Uh, without additional revenue, we will not be able to open up the fire station. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, we may build it. Uh, we'll see. That's, that's uh, further out in the, the cycle here. So we'll see where we are from a revenue perspective. Next slide. So I, I think 
I've given you a sense of, you know, what will happen if we do nothing. As the mayor said, the budget deficit that we're looking at is approximately $19 million. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's 10% of our general fund budget. Uh, uh, as many have pointed out to me, a 10% reduction is a decimation. Uh, uh, that sounds bad. Uh, and I think, you know, we can all agree that uh, a decimation is, is a, a bad thing. And we haven't put forward specifically what that will look like, uh, but I can tell you it will be painful across our organization and there simply is no way to avoid that uh, without additional revenues. And I know that sounds dire and I know it sounds somewhat melodramatic, but that is the reality of where we are today. Uh, next slide. All right, so we're in the midst of this budget process. Uh, we've got a long ways to go. Uh, our hope and dream is that on June 12th, we will have a budget in front of city council that we can adopt. Uh, uh, we have to adopt a balanced budget and we have to adopt that balanced budget prior to June 30th of this year. Uh, so. We are on track to do that. As the mayor said, we've got a long ways to go uh, and a lot of conversations, and this is one of them. So next slide. Next. Thanks. Oh, there is no next slide. Good. You're probably glad to hear me stop. So <laughs> there we go. All right. I'm not sure who's next. Is there anyone else that would interested in chatting before we open up for questions? From us? Yeah. Oh, sure. Sure, I'll, I will go. So I, I really appreciate the scenario that the mayor and city manager have laid out and I also want to thank the budget staff. We are in a situation and I wanna talk a little bit about what we're doing to provide accountability and transparency. First of all, coming here, is one of the things that I think is critically important to hear from our business community and our business leaders to get your impression, your input, and hopefully your buy-in on what we want to do at the city of Salem. There are a variety of other accountability needs that the city already employs. We do a financial audit every year required by law. We have a budget committee, again, required by law, and one of our intrepid members is here. We have a lot of eagle eyes on the budget committee this year, lots of folks with professional budgeting experience, experience with working large budgets, and they ask a lot of questions. And of course, all of our meetings are open to the public. You're welcome to come to any and all of those. We've also done a variety of performance audits over the year, including one that I made a motion for in 2020. And there are additional options available to us. We could, for example, add an additional staff member to our finance department to focus on. We could add an internal auditor position. We had a couple auditors provide testimony at our most recent budget committee meeting. And what internal auditors have the potential to do is to look at ways to identify cost savings and increase efficiencies ways to recommend how to improve outcomes, looking at performance metrics. Financial audit makes sure your math makes sure that the math is adding up, but internal auditors can tell you whether the programs are doing what they should be doing or whether you're getting good use of are we using homeless services. So those are just some of the things that we can do. I am aware of the fact that if you're going to have an internal auditor, the independence of that auditor is every so when you look at other cities and other jurisdictions who have internal auditors, they use means to ensure that that person has the independence that they need to do their work and that they can report directly to the governing body to ensure that any information they want is theirs to have. Anything they want to investigate, they have uh, free reign to do so and so on. So those are just some of the things that I'm thinking about here. Every time I'm in the budget cycle, I want to know what we can do to ensure accountability and transparency, because you need to know whether your money is being spent well. And I think that we are, 
but I also think that we can should be following best practices or that you can have faith in the city government and that your money is being spent wisely. The only other comments that I would make for the safe and secure community proposal, AKA the employee pay payroll tax, there are a couple of tweaks that I've recommended to it. One is to exempt minimum wage employees. I used to live paycheck to paycheck before I went to law school and I hated every minute of it. And I know what it's like to be accountable for every single dollar in my tiny little so to me, I don't want to see uh, a payroll tax that adds a burden to people who are already struggling to make ends meet this economy with this inflation rate and with our very low vacancy rate. Other tweak that I have recommended is adding $300,000 for our mobile crisis unit funding. I'll tell you that now that I run a nonprofit, I have had the same experience that business owners have told me about. I've had to ask a person experiencing homelessness to leave my property. And it is a very awkward conversation. I've had many members of the chamber contact me about that and say, this is why they're so proud of mobile crisis student funding, because now I get it firsthand. I know that for that first ask, I want to ask that person to gently leave I want to refer them to services. I want them to be okay. I don't want to call the police the first time that someone stumbles onto my property and appears lost or confused or disoriented. So I have asked that we add mobile crisis unit funding to that employee pay payroll tax, which we would use in collaboration with our county governments so that we can free up our police and fire resources to respond to those higher acuity calls, the ones that are dangerous. But we have a lot of people in the Salem area who have mental illness, who have a lot of needs, who have comorbidities, and frankly, positively respond to a civilian crisis worker, a peer specialist, a qualified mental health professional, and so on. So those are the couple of tweaks that I've added. And I just want to say thank you all for your attention today. And if there are any questions that you want to raise during today, or if you want to meet with me offline, I am available to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know that we're going to have at least one or two questions because I have one or two, uh, but I do want to open it up to the group um, first. Uh, but before doing that, um, Councillor Stapleton or um, uh, Paul, the Citizen Budget Committee, do either of you want to add anything before we open up to questions? We have about maybe 30 minutes of Q&A. Sure. I'll, I'll just say maybe two minutes or, or sure. less. Sure. Um, thank you all for inviting me here today. It's really great to, to be in here uh, with you all. Um, it has been a really trying conversation for the last, uh, I've been on council a little over two years now, uh, and this has been part of the conversation the whole time. Um, and so we are... Uh, very aware of the struggles and um, we are trying to uh, approach this as best we can. Um, last night we did hear from staff a lot about the challenges that our employees are facing, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, hiring, retention, um, employee well-being, um, mental health struggles, um, and work-life balance. Those are all the same things that we are facing at the city. Um, I have grave concerns when it comes to our emergency response. Uh, folks, and I want to make sure that they have what they need in order to be successful. Um, that only adds to the livability of our community and ensures the safety of everyone here. And so um, those are some of the things that are sitting heavy with me, especially after last night's meeting, um, and some of the things that I'm going to be really focused on moving forward. But I'll, I'll stop there um, and leave it to Paul. I don't know if you have any yeah, I think the only thing I would add just from a citizen perspective, um, I've been on the budget committee, I think this is my sixth year of the, the budget cycle. Um, and I the Councilor Nordyke said it well, we the, the group of citizens that come together to participate on the budget bring a collection of experiences. And this year especially, I think we have more people looking through the back of the book and making sure all the you know pencils are being counted correctly and you know playing their own internal auditor role. Um, I see, especially after six years of budgeting for the city, having done federal budgets and some private sector budget too, um, I really try to look a little bit farther down the road. Does this 
the project's going to just continue to Salem just grow and Salem being a great place to live. We make a big deal of the 26,000 people that have come to the city since 2008. My family accounts for four of those people. We want to stay here. Um, this is a great community. But I think some of these really core services that would be um, have not been able to grow along with our city is going to make it more and more difficult to say this is a great place to live. And I think it would be more difficult to say this is a great place to have a business. And uh, we're now at a place, my family's at a place where we're just remote workers. I don't, I don't even, the company I work for is based out of Portland, Washington, D.C. Our choice to live here is just that, it's a choice. But we want to continue to make it because we think Sam's great. Um, so, your uh, Ward One citizen member, um, I think the the idea that I'm looking for is what is it going to be like to live in Salem in five years? What is it going to be like to live in Salem in ten years when my kids are um, going to make the same decision to live in the city? And uh, I want to make sure it's an amazing and safe and welcoming and livable community. So. Kind of my perspective on how I see these Thank you. Uh, Josh, I'm glad you're here. I see you got a big book in front of you and you were likely gonna be center stage for the next few minutes with questions. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up. Uh, John, please. Uh, well, quick comment. Uh, one small business guy. I'm jealous of your uh, revenue model. Um, I would take a guaranteed three percent revenue increase year over year over the uh, My business. Um, but with that, if I can interject one thing, with that comes things like employee unions with binding arbitration, where we don't get to control the wages, all sorts of things that are, that make that the costs really out of our control a lot of times. Furs costs, all sorts of things. So it's not as simple as just the revenue. Sorry, dinner. Yeah. Um, I don't understand when you talk about adding 26,000 people uh, from a percentage standpoint, what does that equate to in terms of growth? 20%. 20%. And I assume these 26,000 people, you know, live in houses and go to businesses and so forth. Um, what has the uh, tax base grown by uh, in that time frame? It's a good question. Josh, do you have that? I think my question. Uh, uh, I don't have that in front of me. What I can tell you is that the same limitations that the mayor spoke about, measures five and 50, uh, create a really interesting uh, dynamic when you're adding properties. So, the, yes, we've added properties. And we do see higher growth in that 3%. We see about 4%, 4.1%. I think 4.11 is our estimate in the current budget. Uh, so that new development, those new houses being added is that, that additional 1%. Um, one thing you might not be aware of, uh, it's very nuanced and I hope you never have to really think about it, uh, the chain of property ratio. So when a new property is built and it rolls onto the taxes, uh, say it's an $80 million property, it gets discounted. Uh, you'd think that if it, it gets put on the tax rolls at full value, uh, it's reduced. So between 50 to 70 percent is what it comes on the tax rolls, uh, depending on the current spread uh, between the assessed value and real market value. So it's it's uh, discounted. Um, some communities, uh, I'm speaking to my colleague in Bend, uh, they have a even higher spread. So they they get properties rolling on at less than 50 percent uh, value. So so yes, new new development does bring property tax revenue. Uh, it brings that up to 4.1 percent. As the mayor was speaking about, uh, you know, a lot of our employee costs, uh, we have very little control. First rates are given to us by the state. Um, uh, a lot of our unions are uh, inviting arbitration. We've been inviting arbitration the last few years. Uh, so we do a one way proposal and then we're told that it's something else. Uh, so a lot of our costs are extremely outside of our control. So we're what you're looking at is the volume of service, not the not the cost of their generated. The last comment that this uh, guy, you know, if you added this much revenue between the uh, three percent you go over here, 
and the added uh, property tax base, but you said that you have the same number of employees, then the, that means that a whole lot more money is going to the same number of employees. And I mean, I understand that you're like, you, you know, every time we get into this conversation, oh, I always see like FERS plays a big part of this. And um, it just seems like uh, demanding that the Oregon State Legislature do something about the FERS situation uh, is something that uh, there ought to be some a little more fist counting over as well. Well, they have uh, made adjustments to it, but there's there are legacy people who are still under the old systems. Uh, and there's tier one, there's tier two, there's tier three, there's, I don't know, there's all these different tiers with varying levels of benefit. And as those uh, older, you know, tier one folks, tier two folks, as they roll off, those costs do decrease, but uh, it just it's a matter of attrition and it's not a matter of something that we can enforce. So the current public employee retirement system is a 401k system, like most private sectors, basically. But those certainly those uh tier one and tier two folks are more than that for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Please. In terms of uh income again, sites like the EGM. And the city owns planning to sell, um, and then also vacancies in terms of city spaces. Um, I'm looking at that in terms of revenue. So, do you know the uh, the property property uh, the property owns? How many of that is the back revenue to the market, and also revenue producing of the property? So those property, I can speak in general terms, and Josh or Keith can probably do the specifics. But those properties are owned by the Urban Renewal Agency, uh, which is the city council, but it is a separate legal entity. So we purchase those and then the money, the revenue that we get back from the sale of those properties will go back into the urban renewal agency fund. And then those monies are available for the various urban renewal projects. They're not available to the general fund. I guess the only thing I would add to that is that the UGM property, for example, it is our intention to go through an RFP process, select a private developer and to ultimately see that property go back onto the tax rolls and be contributing to our revenue stream. Uh, of course, we're gonna look at, you know, how can we add to affordable housing in the downtown and how can we meet some other objectives, but ultimately the property will not be owned by the city. It'll be developed by a private entity and it will be provide, you know, a range of market rate and affordable housing. My question on this, like of uh, the balance sheet, let's say how much UGM site is what a three to five million dollar uh, asset city of the books, but how much like is a forty million dollar one item on the assets of the city right now? What do they So, so a couple of nuances with that. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, it's the urban rural agency, so it's a separate legal entity than the city of Salem. Uh, so even when it's sold, uh, it won't go back on the tax rolls. Uh, the city of Salem, the chariots, everyone who wants to see the tax base and sell that area is closed. The, the actual balance of property, you know, that's uh, that's in that final. I don't, I don't have that number with my name. We'll get it to you for sure. So the reason why I asked that is a question like that John had in terms of Base. So I don't know how much city currently owns that we expect to come on that. So you're looking at the 2026. Okay. I understand a little bit more of your question, Jim. So we own very little property that like the UGM. We own the UGM site and we own, own the marquee site, or we're just getting ready to close on the marquee site, which is uh down near the the uh across from the convention center, kind of that piece that was going to be a rehab facility we bought that but other than that we don't keep property on our books we dispose of it so that there other than those two parcels there there might be little fragments here and there that were created by a road realignment or something but we don't generally speaking you know we were disposing of that property there's very few assets on the, the city but the, ultimately those will roll back onto the property rolls for sure once they're sold and developed we don't know when that'll be or you know that, that that certainly will happen and that will help ultimately for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Hey, Mick. I have a couple of questions. Um, how many new employees are being added to the payroll? What's the question? How many new employees are being added? So, so right now we're still in the recommendation phase. We don't know what the final answer will be, but Keith, what's your recommend? Was your recommended budget? I believe there are thirty-eight new positions in the budget, and Josh can provide the details. Yeah, uh, just real quick, we provided a breakdown to the budget committee last night that would be helpful. We can get that out to you. Um, some are related to the increase in the operations fee. Others are just needs uh, from, from the leadership team and the general fund. Uh, there's also some transfers and restructures. So they're not new positions, uh, but they're new to the general fund. Um, we have some, uh, they used to be reimbursed uh, back to the utility fund, but we're moving into the general fund and simplifying things a little bit. Uh, but 30.03 general fund. Being added for the utility fund and transportation, uh, 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 but they do have separate revenue sources. Those are. The other question I have is um, if I read this correctly, I just took the middle percentage, the payroll tax 0.56, and the median income here is about $53,000. So Roughly, say five thousand dollars a month. You're looking at a two hundred fifty dollar loan tax. Did I calculate that right? Well, I'm going to get out a calculator to make. <laughs> Yeah, two hundred fifty dollars if it's uh, fifty three. I think the median household income is a little higher, but I think maybe the individual income is more. Uh, and you're talking about here. So I'd just like to say whether it's official or not, we're all of us in business know we're in a recession. In my business, we're down about thirty five percent. We cut our budget fifty percent because we don't have taxpayers to go back to, so we have to to survive. And everyone, it's pretty clear that. But while I appreciate the consideration for people on minimum wage, even those who are at the median income are struggling and they're using now their credit cards to buy groceries. And so $250 a month. Sorry, it is, it is a year. A year. A year. Okay, fine. $250 is significant. And what I look at is that my question is that if I read this right, please correct me if I'm wrong that we have for current services and sheltering costs, $29 million, is that right? For our homeless issue? Uh, so, so that would be the shortfall to solve the revenue challenge. $29 million and our shortfall is 19 million by 2025. Uh, I think it's 2028, but yes, yes. Okay, so the way I look at this when we're comparing 2008, what we've added to the budget significantly is dealing with the homeless problem, which for people who are new to our city, this is not the great city that it once was. Because we're, we're I mean, our handicapped people can't get down the streets. So this $19 million shortfall, the way I would like to see that the city, I believe that this really came about when we utilized every drug known to me. And um, so we have a lot of druggies and alcoholics on our streets, as well as the mentally ill who cannot be accepted at the Oregon State Hospital. And I would like to see, in exchange for $250 a year, I would like to see my city uh, lobbying at the state capitol to address the issue that is the cause for this $29 million that we're having to invest in people who are really have been attracted not only to our city, but to our state. That would be my comment. I, I wish you would consider taking that up. We do lobby all the time for better mental health services, better, better treatment services. That's We're doing it constantly. Absolutely. Can you get me how many of that there? I do think that there is, uh, there is momentum in terms of behavioral health. It's a it's a frustrating, frustrating process. It, that's a you know, there's the, the federal government, the state government, and the county government. The city, it's it's as, as a city, we're on the receiving end. Like we're left with the result of those failed systems. And if you've heard me talk at all lately, I mean, I, I talk about this all the time, where we are left with the result of these. The, the the federal government defunded mental health services 
a number of years ago. And, you know, the idea was deinstitutionalize people. You can better treat them in the communities. We'll give you a uh, community dollars and you can, but those never materialize. And so those community treatments never happen. So we have people living on our streets who are severely mentally ill. Um, and yes, we are lobbying all the time. I was on the behavioral health committee when I was, for the year I was a state legislator and we were constantly pushing at DHS to get the dollars out the door to the counties uh, so we could provide these services. We're working with our counties uh, closely regarding mobile crisis. They can't hire people. We have actual uh, they have a mobile crisis team set up and ready to go. They just can't find the people to do the job or we would have non-law enforcement mobile crisis today. I mean, they have that infrastructure in place. They just haven't been able to hire people. It's They're very frustrated with it. We're very frustrated with it. Um, so yeah, we spent a lot of time lobbying. I do have hope. I, do, I, know, I know the governor gets it. I know she agrees with this. Um, it, it's trying to move a mountain and trying to get enough providers um, to actually be able to do the job. Well, luckily, we've got programs, you know, Chemeketa is coming to the table. Our new CTEC program is going to help provide a pipeline of, but the, all those things take years. You know, they're not, you don't just produce people that want to do this work overnight. And like all lines of business that you all are experiencing, that we're experiencing, not a lot of people are interested in work right now. It, it seems like we're in this kind of weird place in our country. It's not unique to Salem. It's not unique to Oregon. And it's, um, but here we are. Councilor Schaefer, then you Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think the, the commitment on that front from the city council here is evident by our uh, top priorities that we are looking for uh, support from the state legislature. If you look at those three or four things, it, you know, we have narrowed it all the way down to what we see as the key points that we need support in. And that is help with our unhoused and our unsheltered folks. Uh, because it takes a huge toll on the city, um, not just the city government, but the residents here, the businesses here. Um, and we are committed to trying to get that support and have been for, for years. And our uh, and our lobbyist knows that. And, and we are committed to, to trying to get that help. And we have been successful in a lot of ways. Um, and I am very hopeful. I think everybody on council is, we are trying to be very optimistic that we're going to get the help that we need on that front. Thank you. The problem is we continue to treat the symptom and not the cause. When this state legalized every drug, literally as a realtor, I was encountering people who are moving here because we can do anything we want to do here. That's the cause. That's what I like to see you legislate or lobbying for living in the field. So a couple of nuances with that. Um, I, you know, as a 30-year law enforcement professional, I don't disagree. But a couple of nuances, with, they weren't legalized, they were decriminal. So it is still, it's just not a criminal offense. It's, I know that's subtle, but it isn't legal. It is just not criminal. Um, and it was, it was something that the voters did. So it's not even, it's not something the legislature did and they are working. There is a bill to try to fix it uh, somewhat, but until the voters repeal that, you know, that's where we are. I think that's incredibly important. We have three questions. I want to make sure we get through real quick. Brent, and then BJ, and then Jim. Uh, quick try and uh, some questions. Uh, we have such short memories. You know, we have a municipality, uh, which historically has never been the whole to take care of the homeless. If that's right. If you're talking about a government entity that does not have a health department, doesn't have a mental health department. That's right. Department, but now the citizens are screaming at policymakers to do something about them or for them, and that's a very tough role. Personally, I don't think it's a municipal role. The county has a health department, the state has not health and so forth, but you're in a tough situation. I would think what's re unrealistic when we're looking at projections is trying to maintain a now super high level of services for this segment of the population that you didn't use to serve trying to maintain a level that you've got with one time money. So my feedback is like, you, you, it just can't be done. You can't take the one time money and, and have services up here and then try to maintain them. We will cut those services. Yeah, so. If we don't, if there isn't revenue to sustain them. And we said that going in, we said that when we started them. This is one time money. We have we we heard from you all. I mean, we've been in this room where you beat the crap out of us about the homeless, homeless situation. We heard you and we addressed it and we are addressing it and we're trying to sustain it. 
But if we can't come up with revenue, those services are going to be cut. Yeah. We're going to cut the homeless services before we cut the police department or the fire department. I can tell you that. So my money questions, um, and maybe you can come back or something, but is there's information coming out to the public about the increase in the general fund flows as some of our community investments roll up in five zones uh, abatements? I'm thinking of Home Depot and Amazon that get uh, property tax abatement for a period of time. How much impact will those rolling back into the tax rolls help? Uh, is one question. The other is: there, Is there a mechanism in the downtown urban renewal area? Because as to the other question, that de redevelopment is going to stay in the urban renewal area unless you're allowed to flow part of it into the general fund, um, like at Fairview. Uh, the collections are being flown through to the general fund of all the tax entities, which is great. Um, but now we have a pretty robust downtown urban renewal area that will probably never go away. Is there a way to carve off a percentage of that to allow it to flow to the general fund? I got to look down the road for that one. If, if I may, your first question, uh, we work with four county assessors to look at properties. We, we provide four or five year forecast individual property projections. So we, we calculate that. I mean, on the tax rolls when those properties fall off uh, their exemption. Uh, to the other question, uh, urban renewal areas are pretty unique. Uh, there's no real way to carve off funding. Uh, you can collect less. Uh, as a city council policy choice, they can collect tax less tax increment and return some to the taxing jurisdictions, but then you would have less of those dollars uh, to use for economic development. So it's really a trade off uh, between those two. Those urban renewal areas impact the general fund significantly. And it's a, it is a policy choice. And it's a policy choice that's been made for decades here in Salem. We have seven, is it seven urban renewal areas? Eight. 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 And it's uh, it impacts the general fund. Those are that's a policy choice. We could change that and stop doing that, and the general fund would be bolstered ultimately. But then the downside is then you don't have the urban renewal dollars to do all the things that we've been able to do over the last few decades. So it, it is a policy choice, and I think it's one that's worthy of debate. Thank you. Uh, BJ, then Jim. Sure, some of you know him from um, Just a quick question, if we don't, uh, I think in the public offer, um, you guys, you know, and I agree with this comment, the issues that we're dealing with on mental illness, and homelessness, drug abuse, kind of outside of the scope you do every day. However, I think our police chief would say not really, right? Because they do have to deal with it on a daily basis, especially if you look at the percentage increase of, of new you know, uh, individuals living in our community. I also think we've had a, a huge increase in crime in the area, probably, I don't know, at the same rate. Um, chief, if you can speak to that. But the big question I think that we hear in the community we need dollars to support that. We do need, you know, to Amy's point, we do need to go, you know, to state and county and deal with the, the root cause of the problem. But the one thing that we always discuss within the community is, you know, the mental illness side is directly correlated, you know, medically, as you see, with the increased marijuana and drug can be used. Where's the marijuana tax right? Right. Where does the city see any of that? Where a lot of the public speaking of the fact that there's this number of the city out there that a lot of people don't know where it goes. So we do see it. Um, and it was recently reduced uh, through measure 110. Now those dollars are going to treatment. And so treatment services are being set up. So they they don't come to the city anymore. They we just last night had the hearing on what to do with the dollar, the limited dollars that we do get. It goes to support police patrol. And so that's what we do with those dollars. But I can you, Josh, can you remind us what the number was and what it is now, roughly? Yes, we lost about four hundred thousand dollars annually uh, with the measure one ten. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't really expect from staff the only I can look for uh, we do have a local uh, marijuana tax, three percent. Um, we have looked at different bills that have been in the legislature to increase that cap uh, that would allow Salem to have a vote and we could increase that marijuana tax, but we haven't we haven't seen that, that happen in the last couple of sessions. There's been bills out there, uh, but the state shared the marijuana 
uh, was reduced by four hundred thousand dollars. Thank you, Josh. Jim. Hey, uh, thank you, Jim. Um, Mayor Boyd, we got the opportunity to talk to you with a couple of yep. topics came up that I think might be. So one of the we were talking about was about the budget situation, part of the property tax base being so vital in our community, and we're short on property tax right now. Um, the base is, is smaller than it really needs to be. So the, I think the two big questions that I have for you is. We talk about low income housing, which is oftentimes multi family, oftentimes um, out of state, out of town developers are doing those projects. Uh, and, and we have the, I would like to call it tax sunset, but it's the abatement, right? So we're not building that property tax. So the, the counter to that right now is we have, and Josh mentioned uh, developments. The, the counter to that right now is we have. Local home builders in our community that their businesses have shrunk 40, 60, 80 percent because the available space to be able to build homes on, which would ultimately add to the property tax base. So, my question to you is how do we, how do we expand that? You mentioned we talked about urban, urban, or urban growth boundary expansion that begins at your level of request. On urban growth expansion. So, what does that look like uh, in projections future for us to be able to build our, our tax base? Because we are going to run out of space to be able to build homes that are going to add to our property tax base, right? And in turn, that's going to take businesses out of our communities. We represent 29 home builders at my company. 17 of them are building away from here now because they don't have space to build on. So what, what does that look like? Because I think it's a win-win-win across the board. We have more home builders being able to build, home buyers are able to buy, tax base being grown. So there were a few things in that yeah. question. <laughs> so let, Trying to, let, let, me, let me, I want to unpack from the... Request, expand, and... So we have more available land. I want to start back with your first one, though, about the affordable housing and out-of-state people building those. I'm not aware of any out-of-state builders doing. Hold on a second. I, I'm not aware of any out of out-of-state builders. Those are all. It's neighborly ventures. It's there are some places from Portland. There's Mahoney. It's people. Yeah, it's, it's people who are locally who are doing those developments. Um. Maybe, I mean, those are DR Horton isn't uh, not something we're doing affordable housing with. We don't have anything with that. So, those are private developers doing the thing that we don't do anything with. So, uh, all the folks that are when we when we're associated, it's uh, uh, you know, it's Deacon from Portland, it's Billy Ventures, it's those are the people that we're doing affordable housing with. In terms of the um, urban growth boundary, and I am not an expert on this law, so I'm going to give it my best shot and hoping that, I don't know if there's anybody, we didn't bring the right people for that question, but uh, there are rules about when you can expand the urban growth boundary. And I believe that the circumstances do not exist in Salem for us to request a, any sort of increase in our urban growth boundary. We do not, the, the conditions don't exist that allow us to meet the criteria to do that, as I understand it. Um, we have a combined urban growth boundary for the last one in the state, which is two cities that share an urban growth boundary, we share Kaiser. They have a significant interest in splitting and expanding their urban growth boundary because they are, out, in their minds, out, completely out of uh, land. Uh, we we have buildable land in Salem. It's difficult. All of our spaces that are left are the, the hard places to build. You know, they're, it's the hills. It's, it's where there's you know, it's the expensive places to build, honestly. And but it's in the way our land use laws work, there it's still buildable land. And so, as I understand that, we do not meet the criteria to even to be considered for that at this time. So, and my is exactly, it's not here. Uh -huh. So, um, he asked about city-owned land. So, what is the city paying for the UGM site? We we the the urban renewal agency purchased it. I don't recall the purchase price off the top of my head. 
but there's no there's not an on i mean we so we paid to do all the mitigation to kind of make it development ready essentially to try to make it attractive um, so, but there's not ongoing costs I, that I'm aware of at this time. So we'll be selling that and recouping, hopefully, those costs. Uh, real quickly, I just want to highlight, per the agenda, we are about seven minutes behind schedule. However, which means we would release our guest panelists and then we would talk internally. I think we need to have a quick conversation. Before we do that, I just want to make sure I want to highlight on the employee paid payroll tax. That's for every employee, state, city, county, is that correct? Anybody who, who works in the city of Salem and rece receives a payroll would be, yes. And, and so the idea behind it is that it's one way to capture like, sort of from an additional group, people who don't pay tax, people who live elsewhere and work here. They would- And is there a mechanism- Writing for services. Perfect, thank you. And is there a mechanism to be able to do that or not allow the unions to agree today, but then in a year or two years, say through a collective bargaining, nope, we're going to put this back on. The if state's got to pay it. The city's got to pay it. That's not something subject to union negotiations. This is a, it's a, anybody who gets a payroll, anybody who receives payroll in the city, whether you work for the city of Salem, this Marion County, it doesn't matter. If you okay. work in the city of Salem, you would be subject to that tax. And is it working in city of Again, I'm sorry, I just working need to ask this. Salem. Working in the city of Salem. So if you're working in the city of Salem. So is it up to, I guess the point of clarification, if I can dig, is, is it going to be up to the employer to sell state, state who Gosh. of my workforce is in Salem? Because there's a lot of creativity that occurs. And I understand the net of what we're going to, but yeah. the, the, the minutia of that, the nuance, I love Josh's word, I uh, heard it a few times last night, and I'll leave that into my own repertoire. The nuance is. These are questions we've been asking as well. We have the same, but, and I'm going to defer down to Josh for right now on that one. And I'm going to try to caveat that the city council hasn't made a recommendation. They haven't approved the structure or even a process or rate or even the, the basis for the tax. Right. Uh, that said, uh, we've been talking to the Department of Revenue and other municipalities that collect taxes. Um, it, you know, it'll be a challenge. Uh, we're looking at a couple different ways to, you know, base the tax on. We have our legal department looking at uh, different things. One is... Uh, employers who are located in Salem and just all their payroll would be applicable. Another is uh, all work performed in Salem. Uh, and that one's a little more challenging. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're outside of the city, you know, we can't require an employer to remit taxes on uh, their employees if they're outside of the city. Uh, we don't have the jurisdiction. Um, so so it, it's complicated and it's nuanced. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you don't want to hear. We'll be going through a rulemaking process if it goes forward. Um, administrative rules of how that works, how it's administered. We'll be we'll looking to all of you to how to make it as simple as possible for delivery. That's one thing that uh, has been in the forefront of discussion with the city council is uh, reducing the impact on the employers of the administration, making it as simple as possible. Uh, but yeah, there, there's still open questions. Um, there's precedent uh, across the state. Uh, we're also talking to the Department of Revenue about information sharing that will help with compliance. Um, you know, they collect the state transit tax right now. Um, but we're hoping to work with them on, uh, on a way to work with them on information sharing so we can get that individual tax data uh, to be able to compare those to the taxes. Thank you. I, I have a few more questions, but I think uh, just in the sake of time, we have to have an internal co conversation. Um, Josh, with your permission, I'd like to just shoot you a couple pointed questions that that I can then report back to the group and happy to copy everyone on the panel if that's okay, whatever is easiest. So with that, uh, join me in thanking the group for joining us today. Thank you.